Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Welcome back, everybody, to another amazing episode of For the Love of Money. Today, I am so dang excited to sit down with somebody who I look up to so much, somebody who helps set the pace for me, Bedros Koulian. Now, Bedros is known as the Empire Builder. He's a high-performance coach for entrepreneurs. He has started the fastest-growing fitness business in the United States right now, Fit Body Boot Camps. He is one of the most sought after entrepreneurs and coaches in the business today. But imagine this, imagine arriving in the United States from the Soviet Union back in just 1980 and you're six years old and your parents are so poor when they just get here that they put you to work immediately just to make ends meet. Imagine both the scars and the strengths that that type of situation would give you. Well, we dive in and we talk about the scars and the strengths and how each of us can find the strengths from our scars that we've earned in life. Also, we talk about how to raise your children to have the grit and the work ethic, something that he calls the immigrant edge. And we discuss how to ask for what you're really worth in any business you're in, how to sell unapologetically. And then we talk about how to grow your confidence and become more outgoing and that it's actually an exercise that you need to do that is crucial to your success. And he is going to blow your mind with his stories about giving and just how unapologetic he is about both earning huge and giving huge. You are going to love this episode. It is one of my all-time favorites. So sit down, get ready, because here we go. All right, Bedros, my friend, I am so grateful and excited to have you on today. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Chris. Thank you so much for the opportunity, man. Seriously, my pleasure. You know, it's funny because I first got to meet you at Lewis Howe's Mastermind a couple months ago, and I remember sitting there literally mesmerized by your story. I mean, I knew who you were and what some of your awesome accomplishments were, like being CEO of you know the world's fastest growing fitness franchise, Fit Body Boot Camp, and that you're a master of putting together masterminds and creating explosive business growth. But once I actually heard your story, you know, things like as a child, you grew up eating out of dumpsters and and couldn't speak a word of English when you got, I mean, I was blown away and all of my excuses went right out the window. So would you mind starting by sharing that story um, with everyone that's listening? Yeah, absolutely, man. And I, again, appreciate this opportunity because I kind of look at this as my life's mission is to install what I call the immigrant edge within people who have never experienced being an immigrant. And and I don't think anyone should have to experience that, to be honest with you. So my father decided that we were going to escape communist Armenia at the time it was under Soviet Union rule. In 1980, he bribed the Russian government, the communist government, and we escaped Armenia. I was six years old. I was the baby of the family. And when we escaped, you know, people always ask me, were you scared? I wasn't scared because when you're six years old, you remember everything. But as long as you're with your mom and dad, you're fine. You know, my older brother and sister, you know, they were one was uh, 19, one was 22. They were scared. Um, But I certainly wasn't. I was with my parents. But when we came to this country, to the United States, as political refugees, uh, we were poor, we were broke, we didn't understand the language, we didn't understand the culture, and um, we had to find our own way. Now, I always tell people that I became the breadwinner, and they go, how was a six-year-old the breadwinner? My dad, the very next day that we got here, he found us a in someone's, someone's two-bedroom apartment they rented us one of the bedrooms. So a family of five, if you could even picture this, Chris, was living in someone's one-bedroom apartment, like oh. the actual one-bedroom of their two-bedroom apartment. And that was us. And and it was like a slum, but we were very grateful, and we had only a little bit of money, and so my dad had to do what he needed to do. But the very next day, he was out there delivering newspapers. Uh, two days after that, he was delivering newspapers and pumping gas. And by the end of the first week of being there, 
He was delivering newspapers, pumping gas, and washing dishes at a pizzeria. He got my brother a job at the same gas station, and my brother would work day shift. My dad would work the night shift. My sister got a job at a, at a different restaurant doing some odd jobs. And so we, we got by. And where I became the breadwinner was we were so broke that that money had to get used to find us an apartment of our own because the guy who let us use that apartment, that room, only gave us one month. And so my dad had discovered that grocery stores have these giant dumpsters behind them and they throw away their food that has expired but hasn't necessarily gone bad or maybe it has a little bit of mold in it, but you can certainly salvage it. And so my dad would pick me up and give me a boost and he'd throw them into these dumpsters. And for me, it was like a treasure hunt. <laughs> and you know, now I think back and I go, holy crap, we were dumpster diving and eating out of the dumpster. But back then as a kid, you know, your dad goes, hey, okay, get that gallon of milk. Okay, now get that lettuce, so get the bag of bread there, get the cheese. And so, all right, it was a treasure hunt. But it was a pretty rough upbringing, man. Um, I got laughed at as a kid. I wore funny clothes, you know, foreigner clothes. I was, uh, I, I didn't speak English, obviously. And so when I tried to raise my hand in kindergarten to go to school, I didn't know how to, how to, how to articulate myself. And the teacher yelled at me when I tried to stand up <clears throat> to go pee. And so I just ended up peeing myself. And when you pee yourself as a kindergartner, you, you can imagine kids can be cruel. And so my parents took me out of that elementary school, sent me to another elementary school where things didn't go any better. And so I've gone to three elementary schools, two junior highs, two high schools. When uh, we lived in crappy apartments and I got lice, my mom would wash my hair with gasoline that she would make my dad pump out of uh, our old Ford LTD because we couldn't afford lice treatment. And so my dad always had the saying around the house and he said, we always run out of money before we run out of month. And so, you know, I grew up with, a very odd upbringing because I've eaten out of dumpsters, I've worn clothes that weren't mine, and were probably a decade out of style. Uh, had my mom cut my hair, had kids laugh at me. I was the master of building rapport because, dude, if I would move into your neighborhood, I didn't know how long we were going to be in town until we had to move again. So I would make friends with you like as quickly as I could so that I could have a friend uh, until we had to move again. And later on in life, that rapport building skill ended up paying off in dividends as I went into, you know, sales and ultimately became an entrepreneur. So all these adversities that I experienced as an immigrant became my edge. And so I call, you know, I always say I've got the immigrant edge and I'm the American dream. That's really the synapses of who I am. The stories, first of all, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And, you know, here I am raised in the Midwest in a middle-class family and had nothing like that to deal with. And it makes me wonder, while it was going on as a child, did it feel like a tough upbringing or did it just feel like what was normal? Man, it felt normal. And you don't realize the scars that were left until you're older. And uh, I'll be very transparent with you, man. Uh, for the last three years ago, I got a therapist because I realized... I'm having these massive anxiety attacks. I'm getting these essential tremors. And essential tremors are where your nervous system shuts down on you. It usually happens you know, in the evenings. Um, and I was working myself to the bone. And, and, and I couldn't figure out if I've got seven companies. One of the biggest one, Fit Body Bootcamp, is an international franchise. You know, we're being offered hundreds of millions of dollars to sell it. And I'm not you know, in the position to sell it. I don't want to sell it. So it wasn't like we're lacking money. Yet I was opening up businesses and, and launching things left and right. And it was a real simple thing. I was operating out of fight or flight because I never wanted to be so broke and poor again. And people always go, what's the difference between poor and broke? You know, broke is when you don't have money. Like I could make a couple of bad decisions or Chris, you can make a couple of bad decisions with your investments or your business decision. And we could both be broke. Poor is a state of mind. Poor is where you, you, you know, there's the, the us and the thems. And, you know, my dad would always say, you know, us, we're always broke them. They're always rich. And so I was in the poor state of mind and I was always financially broke. And so I was working so hard that I would get anxiety attacks and essential tremors because I didn't want to be poor and broke again. So for me, I had to figure out how to find peace with the scars that were left from childhood. So I didn't feel the damage of childhood until I got older. And subconsciously, the, the way my therapist Kevin describes it is he goes, you have these filters on that tells you that 
if you lose it all, you're going to be a poor, broke kid again who's going to get laughed at and, and, and live in the, the slums and have your hair washed with gasoline, which obviously isn't going to happen even if I was poor and broke again because there's so much financial aid these days available to people. But I was operating from that place, and so I was dealing with so much anxiety and, and uh, essential tremors, man, that I had to go find a therapist and work through this shit. Pedro, that's, first of all, thanks for your transparency. And, and second of all, it's absolutely incredible to think that somebody at your level is still working through something that might come from a bit of a, a scarcity mindset. And that's what's you know fueling you to go out there and start all the companies and be so successful. It's funny because you can almost look at that upbringing as giving you, obviously, some scars, but at the same time, some incredible strengths uh, as evidenced by your story. And you kind of call those strengths the immigrant edge. You know, there's so much talk right now on the news about immigration and, and the debates and all that stuff around it. Do you feel that immigrants come with a stronger work ethic and desire to succeed or maybe even a little bit more of that, that grit or that toughness that you need to succeed more than someone who's just born and raised in, you know, typical U.S. here? Yeah, I, I'm going to say this. I'm going to qualify it. And I guess maybe as a foreigner, as an immigrant, I can say this. And I can get away with it. And quite frankly, if anyone has anything negative to say about it, they're more than welcome to say it. But I believe that immigrants who enter this country legally from countries of oppression um, or poverty have this edge and desire. See, because when you enter legally, you go through the legal bureau bureaucracy and red tape and you value J just like you've heard of the phrase, uh, the more you pay, the more you pay attention, yep. right? Which is why I never do free business coaching yep. for people because it just falls on deaf ears. But when people pay me a lot of money, they all of a sudden hear my wisdom. Um, the same thing applies here. And so my dad and I share the same mentality. Like we, he had to not only bribe the Soviet government, but then we had to escape into Italy. And then from Italy, went to the American consul and spent two and a half weeks literally going through the red tape and bureaucracy so we can legally enter the United States. So you come from a, you know, a poverty stricken country of oppression and you legally enter this country, you value it more and you absolutely will have work ethic. That's, that's, you know, unmatched guaranteed. Now the good news is people can raise their kids that way. I'm raising my children, Andrew and Chloe, my son's 11, my daughter is nine to have the immigrant edge. Um, but if you've never had it, then you have to hear it from someone like me or Gary Vaynerchuk, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Elon Musk, uh, Mila Kunis. Uh, and if you haven't heard those stories, then you don't realize what it is to be an immigrant, to, to properly value all the greatness this amazing country of ours has. I love that. And you know what's funny? Over three quarters of my listeners are parents that are also happen to be entrepreneurs. And so if you don't mind... My wife and I talk about this a lot. We don't have kids yet. We're going to have kids. And what we talk about is how do you raise your children when they're going to grow up in an area or a lifestyle of privilege, but still give them that grit and that work ethic and that appreciation of money and, and to know that they have to go out and or, you know build those muscles and, and earn their own keep, so to speak. So what are you doing with your family specifically to help them grow up in that way and, and maintain that grit? That's a really good question. And so for me, it's it's really simple. I keep them involved and remind them that they need to stay grounded. But telling them verbally, see, I'm a big believer as a personal trainer. And you, you, you know my background. I started off as a personal trainer some 20 years ago, you know, and I remember the only thing I remember from the American Council on Exercise Certification Manual was uh, tell, show, do. In other words, it says when you get a new client who doesn't know a particular exercise, you tell them how to do it. You show them how to do it, and then you ask them to do it, and then now they'll have more neuroplasticity because three different ways you've, you've told them, you showed them, you demonstrated it, and then you asked them to do it. And so I do that with my kids. If I just told them that they need to be grounded and uh, just remember that there's people who have far less than them, well, th 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 that's, that's great. In theory, someone out there has less than them, but they haven't met them. So we have 67 kids that we've adopted through Compassion International that my kids write the, you know, someone might say this is punishment, but my kids write letters to them every month. Those little kids write letters to us. My kids write letters to them and they get to see the pictures of where they live. And it's not the streets of Chino Hills where we live. It's in mud huts and stuff like that. Um, you know, Shriners Children's Hospital. We've been, we've been supporting Shriners Children's Hospital for over a decade. We'll go and we'll tour the hospitals and they get to see these little kids who have severe medical issues 
whose families can't afford their medical services and they get to experience, gee, I'm really fortunate that I have my health, right? And my son, I'm teaching him to become a modern day knight. Again, this might be very politically incorrect in this era, but a modern day knight, you're gonna open doors for ladies and for your mom and for your sister today. You know, you're gonna go out there and su summer break, the, you know, their summer break just ended. Both my son and daughter were working here at my headquarters, stocking our refrigerators with soda and, and water and Fit Aid and all this stuff. But I teach them the attention to detail. The immigrant edge comes into the attention to detail. Every single label on the Zevia cans are identical, facing the same way. The uh, Sparklets water bottles facing the same way. Because how you do anything is how you do everything. And so my son and I will take a monthly boys trip and we'll go to Big Bear Lake or Lake Tahoe or somewhere and we'll just have he and me time where we're not flying first class somewhere. We drove our car. Um, my daughter and I go on a weekly date and I open the door for her and we hold hands and she knows that if a, if a boy who's a friend when she's older doesn't open a door for her, that she just turns right back around and comes right back to daddy or she just calls daddy and I come and pick her up from anywhere. Um, and so these are the things that we're doing to ground them to teach them that they don't have to always, uh, what, Christmas gifts. They get Christmas gifts from my side of the family, my wife's side of the family, but they can keep one Christmas gift and the rest we donate to Toys for Tots. And so these are all the things we do to keep them grounded. Certainly we fly first class and we, we went to Scotland last summer and we stayed, I mean, at the, at the Woldruff Hotel, we rented an entire wing of the hotel uh, that was right across the uh, street from uh, Edinburgh Castle. So they experience that side of life, but then I stop and go, hey guys, you know why this is happening, right? Because mom and dad work so hard, are always in service of people, and when you're in service of people, you make money and you can afford this. But then we come back and we donate and write to little children who, who have less than us, et cetera. So we show them both sides of the coin, and I hope that this gives them the immigrant edge, and I believe it does because my son last year goes, hey dad, a, a little Korean kid, came to our school, he doesn't speak English, and I thought of your story, and I befriended him on day one, and I didn't play basketball with my friends for a whole week and hung out with him instead. And dude, I broke down in tears, because imagine if someone had befriended me on day one when I came to this country in 1980. I'm sitting here with the biggest smile on my face. You're exactly the kind of parent that, that I want to be, and I can't wait to watch your kids grow up, because they're gonna have this incredible dynamic of seeing what's possible, at the same time as having all the work ethic and the love of humans and the attention to detail that comes with having to make what's possible possible. I mean, they're going to be, they're going to be ninjas. It's going to be incredible. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. And, and you know what? It's like, I love what my mom and dad did for bringing us to this country. But then people go, well, how did you decide how you're going to raise your kids that way? I go, well, they brought me to this country. There was a roof over my head and food in my stomach. But other than that, I didn't experience much. I didn't get on a plane again. You know, I got on a plane at age six from from Italy to, to the United States. Didn't get on a plane again until I was like 24, 25 years old. My kids were less than one when they were already on a plane traveling this country. And then each of them had already gone international before the age of five. And so it, I do the opposite of what my parents did. And sometimes that's all you got to do. And it works. It's incredible. I love that you're raising such a little gentleman, too. I still, to this day, you know, Lori and I have been married 12 years. Um, next week, open the door for her at every chance possible. I just believe that's the way it should be and the way it always, you know, should be. I agree, be. man. 100%. Good for you. So shift uh, gears a tiny bit here. What age were you then when you decided, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to get into fitness, and I'm going to be a success? That's a good question. I was in my mid 20s, maybe 25, 26, and I was a personal trainer at an LA fitness. And I had a personal training client named Jim Franco. And one day, now Jim Franco, I have to describe him. At the time, he was in his, in his early 60s. He came in Monday, Wednesday, Friday at two o'clock in the afternoon, Chris. And so two o'clock in the afternoon, most of the world is working. And so after the first week, after signing him up and after a week of training him, I felt a little more comfortable. And I said, Jim, do you mind me asking, how is it that you can come in here Monday, Wednesday, Friday to work out with me uh, two o'clock in the afternoon when the rest of the world is, is, is you know, working? He goes, well, I own my own company. I'm the boss and I get to set my own schedule. But I work, wake up early in the morning and I work. And I said, oh, great, fantastic. What do you do? And he told me and he worked in the automotive software industry and he created the software for like auto parts stores, et cetera. And so now, Jim, 
flipped the script on me and he goes, hey, by the way, I've been meaning to tell you something. Last week when I bought personal training from you, you didn't sell me anything. I said, well, I beg to differ. You bought three times a week for six months. He goes, no, 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 you're an order taker. You just took my order. I came in here looking to work with a trainer three times a week for six months to, to 12 months, and then you just took my order. He goes, but I've seen you let people walk in the last week who should be your clients. And so he goes, but tomorrow I'm gonna help you fix that. And the next day, of course, he shows up with a cassette tape from Tom Hopkins, uh, you know, a real estate sales guy, right? Mm -hmm. And he goes, just listen to this and you learn how to be a, a closer instead of an order taker. So he was very harsh, uh, but he was absolutely right. And Tom Hopkins led to Brian Tracy. Brian Tracy led to uh, Zig Ziglar, Zig Ziglar to Dan Kennedy, et cetera. Before I knew it, I'm learning marketing, selling, persuasion, influence. I'm actually working on self-development because throughout the process, I heard about Tony Robbins. And I go, oh, my gosh, Tony Robbins, you know, Jim Rohn. Let me read about these guys and listen to their programs. And had Jim Franco not mentored me in this way, I would have never opened my eyes into being an entrepreneur. And so really I had no plans on being an entrepreneur until Jim Franco turned me on to the Tom Hopkins tape. And that kind of started this avalanche of, you know what, maybe I could do it too. It's incredible. So has Jim Franco had the single biggest effect on your business turning out the way it has, or is there anybody else that's been an incredible mentor that really was a turning point for you? You know, since then I've had and paid for so many different mentors from Frank Kern to Joe Polish to Joel Wendell to Dan Kennedy, you you name it. Um, who, who do we have recently? We're paying four grand a month. Uh, Randy Long, you know, to help us structure our corporation because we're growing so quick as a franchise. Um, but to me, I still get mentors. And, and in fact, in fact, Joel Wendell is still my speaking coach, and I still pay him because if I can articulate better from the stage, then I can share my message more clearly. And so I believe mentors are important, but Jim Franco is still my number one mentor because he opened up this young foreigner's mind and eyes into this idea of you can be an entrepreneur and make a bigger impact. Until then, I took, I, I hate to say this, man, I took pride into being blue collar. And I'm gonna tell you this right now and everybody listening to this, do not take pride into being blue collar. There's nothing prideful about being blue collar. Make more money, make a bigger impact, you have a purpose on this planet, share that purpose with the world, and it's okay to be white collar and to be affluent. Um, the, 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 some reason we take pride in being blue collar is though it's some kind of a badge of honor, and it's not. I couldn't agree more. I think they associate it with you know, working hard or having extra grit, but you can be both. You can work hard, have extra grit, be white collar, and, and be an incredible leader. I totally agree. So did, Shit, you, yeah. did you know deep down, you know, that you're going to be this successful or was it a slow progression as you started to tap into these different leaders and self-development? What was that journey you, like? I knew there was something different about me, but I imagine every entrepreneur is probably going to say that. Right. And, and I guess it's because we kind of felt like a black sheep again. You know, when you look at the age difference between me and my siblings, I was six years old when we came here, they were 19 and 22 because I was the oops baby. So, you know, I grew up differently. I didn't have, you know, brother and sister my age. My brother and sister were like a second set of mom and dad. Um, growing up in a place of being broken poor, we had to constantly hustle and and dump, you know, dive through dumpsters to to get food. And and I remember our first mattress we got out of a um, <laughs> the, one of the same dumpsters where we found food in behind that dumpster. Someone had obviously they moved out of their apartment or whatever. They had thrown away their couch their TV, a recliner chair, and a mattress. And all four of those things we took into our new apartment and that was our brand new furniture to us. And this was someone's obviously garbage. But you know, I had learned to turn, turn that kind of adversity into an advantage. And so I guess over time I realized there's something different about me um, where I don't have resources, I get resourceful. And as it turns out, all those things are like the ideal traits for an entrepreneur. I mean, the best entrepreneurs, you know, know how to put the rest of the world in a box, isolate themselves, put their head down and work. Uh, they know how to take an adversity, turn it into an advantage. They know that when they don't have the resources, they can get resourceful and wily. You know, I couldn't afford a mentor or coach, but I, I quickly realized that Jim Franco is probably the best mentor I'm going to have. And I go, Hey Jim, can I give you a fourth workout per week on me? But with the stipulation that 
I get to ask you any questions I want about business. And one of the best pieces of advice he ever gave me, because I said, Jim, what is the fastest way to, for me to become a millionaire like you? He said, take a little bit of money from a lot of people. And if you look at all seven of my businesses right now, from my software to my franchise, my coaching programs, from my media company where we do ad management for you know, gyms worldwide, all of my businesses, we take a little bit of money or a lot of money from a lot of people, meaning franchise fees, reoccurring software fees, uh, ad management fees. It's all reoccurring payments. And that was the first advice that Jim Franco gave me uh, for free because I gave him an extra personal training session per week. Wow, that's incredible. So kind of sticking with this journey of money mindset um, that you went on, you've ended up coaching a ton of people, I guess in the fitness business, but also in all industries from what I understand. And one of the mm -hmm. epidemics that I see is that people are afraid to sell or they are afraid to ask for enough money in return for their services. So what's the secret to getting over this and getting paid what you're worth? You know, I think the secret lays in, it, it, it's not a sales tool. The secret to selling and getting paid what you're worth is found in self-confidence, self-esteem. The most confident people. In fact, yesterday I was hanging out with Joel Marion. I don't, have you heard of the name Joel Marion? No, I haven't. He runs a nine-figure supplement company called Biotrust. Oh, I know Biotrust, yeah. There you go. Everybody knows Biotrust. Well, he's the guy who sends out those killer promo emails that have like the highest open rates, highest click-through rates. They have millions of people on their list. Um, and so he's out here in Southern California, and we've been hanging out the last couple of nights. And, you know, how, how do I how do I frame this? Uh, I, tell me your question again, because I want to be able to frame this exactly how, how, how it needs to be heard. So we were talking about this epidemic of people not, you know, they're either afraid to sell, or, to sell yeah, right? or they're not asking for money in return for their services. Yeah. So with all due respect to Joel, if you talk to Joel, you see very quickly that he there, there's nothing special about him. And I say this with love. Like, I love him like a brother. I've known him over a decade. You know, whenever I go to Florida, I visit him in Tampa and vice versa when he comes out here. However, Joel, and, and it's not like he's Lewis House where he's, like, tall and handsome. He's a bit overweight, Joel. <laughs> and one of his eyes is a, is a little bit lazy. Uh, you know, and, and this is me saying this, right? And I'm probably one of the ugliest people on the planet. So having said that, but Joel has got confidence He's got self-esteem, he's got swagger about him, and he can get anyone to mail out for Biotrust because he comes with so much thunder. And so the number one thing that people can adapt is not the ability to overcome objections or how can I be more influential like Cialdini or what if I can learn to negotiate better. It is build your self-esteem and confidence so that you know that you deserve more. And once you know you deserve more, you will command more. And that is the missing ingredient in 90% of entrepreneurs out there. All right. So then that leads us to ask the obvious, how does one build their confidence to this point? Oof, you got me there, man. I think that's a work in progress because I'm still in the process. I, I think that's everybody's a work in progress where that's concerned. But, you know, it starts with mom and dad, right? Like right now I'm building my kids' confidence. For example, I was told, and I don't know how you were raised, but I was you know, told that I'm supposed to be seen and not heard. Well, that breaks my confidence as a child. I teach my kids, hey guys, you're intelligent, you're, 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 you're witty, I want you to not be afraid to approach your teacher, your principal, uh, any of the adults here when we're at a party, and talk to them, don't interrupt them, talk to them, shake hands, make eye contact. So one, it starts off during the nurture process, right, when parents are nurturing their kids. Now, but I grew up, not being nurtured to have confidence. Once I realized that confidence was the magical ingredient, I did everything I could to build my confidence. What did I do? As Tony Robbins says, if you fake it long enough, you will actually change your state. So I knew that I started reading books that about building confidence, self-esteem, self-worth. Okay, make eye contact, all right? I started making eye contact. Dude, I was that guy, Chris, that you and I would talk, but I would look at the buttons on your shirt and not, not at your face. That's so hard to believe after meeting you. I, but that was me, right? And so I did the work for over a decade. And so eye contact, firm handshake and not like a limp fish, uh, open doors for people, ask more questions about others. See, when you don't have confidence, people go, oh, tell me about you. And you start vomiting at the mouth about yourself. When people ask me, hey, Bader, tell me more about you. I'll say one thing and then I'll start asking them questions about themselves. And the moment you start asking people questions about themselves, 
they go, you know what, I really like this guy because everyone loves to talk about themselves. So being self-aware helps build confidence. A, a firm handshake, eye contact, right? Just learning that, hey, I'm socially awkward and I it left up to me, I wanna be a wallflower. Instead, I'm gonna go up to people and start making conversation. And you know what, I, when I learned that I'm not good with social interaction, I would go to the mall and I wouldn't leave the mall until I asked 10 people what time it is. Just approaching people at the Boynton Park Mall, Boynton Park Mall, which is a shithole, approaching people and going, excuse me, ma'am, can you tell me what time it is? Uh, my heart would race. But that became so easy that it would lead to, excuse me, ma'am, do you know a good restaurant to eat at here? And I would start more dialogue it, because I, I even read pickup, uh, you know, the, 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 the dating books, the, the, the pickup artist wrote, right? Uh, what's his name? Evan Pagan was one of the first books I read, not because I wanted to learn how to pick up women, but because I learned that these guys help guys build confidence. And so I already had a girlfriend and actually she was my fiance and currently my wife, but I wanted to build my self-esteem and my self-worth. And so you gotta do the work and that's not an overnight skill. You have to shake hands, make eye contact, open doors, start conversations until it feels so natural that your heart doesn't race anymore. And then over time, your confidence is built up there. It's incredible. Full transparency. I've labeled myself my whole life as an introvert when really it was just me being uncomfortable being the conversation started with strangers. And so I've been trying to exercise that muscle over the past couple of years. And you're right. It is a a painful work in progress at first. But if you don't do the work, you get no payoff. Exactly. You know, because it's easy enough to just watch a, uh, a course on how to run a, a Facebook ad campaign. And then within 20 minutes, you've got an ad campaign running to a ClickFunnels page that's making you money. That's easy. But to actually work on yourself, holy smokes, you know, you keep wanting to go back to default, but you have to fight the default needs and security of default, which is, you know, hiding in the corner, being a wallflower, not making eye contact and constantly overriding that shit. And so the easier thing, if, you know, since you said you have all these parents listening, raise your kids like modern day knights and modern day ladies, give them confidence, give them a voice, let them know that they are heard, that they are understood, that they are accepted. And we won't have problems where guys like me have to go through the solutions for over a decade to figure it out. Oh, I love that. So kind of sticking with this building confidence and building yourself up, I want to ask you, Obviously, you make millions and millions of dollars now. Have you always been comfortable receiving, you know, this level of money for your work, or was there a specific work you did around feeling worthy of it? Um, I guess uh, truthfully, that is, I've never had any problem with having worthiness of money. Keep in mind, I've been so broke and poor. I've eaten out of dumpsters, hair washed with gasoline when I had lice because we couldn't afford lice treatment. Uh, I don't even want to go into the greater details of the darkness that I've had to endure because of being poor and broke. Uh, we, have my, we have to pick between do we have running water or electricity or gas? And, you know, those are choices you don't want to have made uh, when you're a kid. And so because of that, the money I have now, and, and listen, I still get told that, man, you've sold out. You know, you're all about the money. You're all about the money. I don't need to tell the world that what I contribute to Shriners or Compassion International or the Lone Survivor Foundation or Toys for Tots, like I don't, I don't, the world doesn't need to know that. Um, and so I talked about it here because I made it a specific point about what we do when raising my kids. Um, but where money is concerned, I've gone so long without money and with being broke that I have no issue with having money. And, um, there's a running joke about me because every now and again, I'll buy a first class seat for my backpack when I travel <laughs> just because I want more. I'm a big guy. I'm a 235 pounds. And so I want more elbow room in first class and I'll buy a first class seat for my backpack. And people say that might be a little too pretentious and there's better things you can do with your money. You let me decide that. You know, what? let's let's go there because that's exactly what this podcast is about. It's, it's about changing that mindset when people say you've sold out or you're all about the money and they forget to check into the freaking greatness that so many people are doing because mm -hmm. they've been successful. And so I know that you're a huge believer in paying it forward and that you challenge even your clients to do the same by donating to whether it's Shriners Hospitals for Children or helping out military veterans by contributing to, you know, the Lone Survivor Foundation. Why is it so important to you to both be a massive giver and that your clients follow suit? 
to me, I learned that I'm a person of service. And I believe that the fastest, easiest way to cure depression and fight the darkness that most of us suffer with, and I know most of us suffer darkness and depression today because mood altering drugs and the prescription of mood altering drugs are at an all time high, Chris. And so that tells me that people are living a shallow life where the only validation and approval they're getting is through a Instagram or Facebook post where temporarily someone will like or love or comment or share and they get a temporary high. And I, the best high I get, the best thing I can do to fight the darkness within is to serve because it just feels good. Make no mistake about it, man. When we donate to any kind of charity, when Cole Hatter from the same mastermind that you're in, Cole Hatter was here last week. Um, and he goes, so I don't get it. You charge 50, people $50,000 to learn what you're about to teach me, how to run a mastermind. Uh, why are you doing this for free? I go, because Lewis House introduced me to his publisher, his agent, and gave me the outline of his book when I didn't know how to write a book and I was you know, stressing out about writing my first book. And I said, so the least I could do was come and speak at Lewis's event, and the least I can do is help any one of his, his clients from his mastermind in their purpose. And he goes, so what do you want from me? I go, you know what? Right now, I got nothing that I want from you. But if the time comes that I, that I want to call in the favor, I want to know that I can reach out to you, Cole, and that I could call in the favor, but only after I've given, given, given. And so I believe that if we all come with service, one, we're always going to get something back in the future. But we can't come with expectation. Number two, being in service of people is deep satisfaction. It's, it's not just shallow approval. It's deep approval. It's lasting approval. It's lasting validation. And... It feels good, and I don't have to get go to the dark places in my life, man. Um, and, and so I think more people ought to consider doing that, being in service, and expecting their clients and customers to be in service. And I expect that of my clients and customers, and I tell them that. I love that. And, and Cole, he's such a good guy. He's He is the guy that will be there with open arms the minute you need something. So I, I love hearing those stories. I operate the same way. And you, I read something interesting. you you got to tell us about this. You helped set the record for the largest single donation of Toys for Tots in history, I guess. What, tell yes. us the story. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. you know Craig Ballantyne? Have just, you heard of just of him. Okay. So you've heard of Craig Ballantyne. He, he wrote a book called Perfect Day Formula. Um, and you know, speaking of being in service, before he ever wrote the book Perfect Day Formula, which is really how to be how to have personal discipline and structure, because as Craig says, structure equals freedom. Um, I was, again, 10 years ago, I was probably the most undisciplined man on the planet. Um, I always hit the snooze button uh, when I would wake up. I, I built my business based on sheer grit and hard work and not because I was smart and structured and, and focused on scaling it. And so before he ever wrote the book, Perfect Day Formula, I learned the Perfect Day Formula through environmental exposure because thankfully, he was a coaching client who later became a business partner. And we've been you know, best friends ever since for over a decade. And so Craig one day, he's got an office in Toronto. He lives in Toronto, but he's got an office in Denver. His business partner, Matt Smith, who was the CEO of Stansbury Financial for a while there. Uh, Matt Smith, by the way, is a true real life James Bond um, kind of guy, like you know, passports to many different countries, et cetera. I just like, he, he's it. And <laughs> stunningly good looking, handsome guy. But anyway. That said, Matt Smith discovers that in Denver, the Toys for Tots chapter in Denver has the most amount of kids who wake up on Christmas morning with, with not a single gift to open, not a single present to open. And so Matt Smith goes, hey, Craig, we're business partners. They run Early to Rise together. Uh, he goes, you and I have a lot of influence with our friends. So you know, they pick up the phone. They call me. They call Joel Marion from Biotrust and uh, probably three other guys. This was maybe six years ago. And we figured, you know, what can we do? Well, we ended up buying $60,000 worth of toys the first year. Last year, we ended up doing a quarter million dollars worth of toys. And as it turns out, it was the single biggest donation of toys and money to Toys for Tots ever. Ironically, Chris, right before I got on this podcast with you, I was having a meeting with my team. And I said, guys, in 2017, on December 2nd, just so you know, December 2nd, we've set the date. And we worked with Target last year, and we're going to do it again. We're going to uh, we're locking down ten Target stores, and Fit Body Bootcamp alone is donating one million dollars to Toys for Tots on behalf of Matt Smith and Craig Ballantyne because they started this whole thing. Uh, instead of so now instead of going to Denver 
as of last year, I decided, hey, guys, I'm going to go shopping here for Toys for Tots with me and my staff and all of our clients, and then we'll just send you guys the receipt. And so I like to 10x everything, and so we're doing a million dollars just on behalf of uh, Fit Body Boot Camp, and we will personally break the record again. Wow, that is the coolest story, and, and, and it's just amazing to hear that you're going to scale up to that million-dollar donation. That It gives me goosebumps here. So you never give to get, and we all understand that, but – how has giving and generosity had an impact on your business growth, if any? It teaches you abundance. Listen, anyone who says like, oh, man, I was born with an abundance mindset is full of shit. We as humans, we have to be selfish in order to survive. You know, the caveman, the caveman doesn't just walk out of his cave and then go to the grocery store. Like he had to be selfish. He had to look out for his well-being because a saber-toothed tiger wanted to eat him. Uh, some disease wanted to kill him right? The, the neighboring tribe wanted to kill him. So we have to be selfish. We're designed to be selfish. We learn abundance over time. And so the best way you can learn abundance is to give without expectation. As it turns out, yeah, it feels good, but you keep giving without expectation and you go, oh, I think there's a universal law here that's working in my favor. And the universal law is the more I give, the more I get. So soon you go, okay, I'm not going to expect it, but I'm just going to know that the law is going to work in my favor. So Listen, I give without expectation, but I'm smart enough to know because I've learned over time and I've seen other smart people talk about this, that the more I give, the more I get. In fact, you know, Zig Ziglar has that famous quote, the more you help people get what they want, the more you'll get what you want in life. Um, and I believe I'd call it universe, call it God, call it the universal mind of humans. That's how that works. But we learn abundance through giving and not just by saying we're abundant minded. That's not good enough. I love that. So to kind of put a bow on this generosity and giving, we, we always do this one question to inspire as many people as possible to give more generously. And we have a little fun with it. I call it the, the two minutes of bragging. So you might have already talked about it. Maybe it was the Toys for Tots. Maybe it's something different. What's been one of your favorite all-time moments of giving? Oh, man. All right. One of my favorite all-time moments of giving was... The, uh, okay, Marcus Luttrell, the guy who wrote Lone Survivor, all right, and then the movie came out. Yep. Uh, he was that Navy SEAL. A few years back, the first year that he started the Patriot Tour. So he travels the country once a year with some other, like, special forces guys, and they get up on stage, and they tell the audience in your town, you know, hey, we're out there fighting a battle, and the reason we can leave our families behind and go fight a battle is because we know that you guys are here supporting our families, like like the cops and the firefighters, first responders, and just civilians like us that, that come to their service, their family service when they're over there, you know, defending our freedom. Well, Patriot Tour had just started. They didn't have any big sponsors. I had gotten wind that they needed uh, a sponsorship uh, really badly to make it to their Arizona venue. And so just out of the blue, we called up and we said, hey, what's how much how much is it going to be? And whatever the cost was, we, we paid it. And um, yeah, here's a dude. Here's a great example of giving without expectation. I had read his book. I'd read his book and I just was like in awe of the mindset of a Navy SEAL, of a special forces guy that three of your buddies can die and you have your hip blown off, you bit your tongue off, you're, you're, you have bullet wounds, the Al-Qaeda is hunting you down. But all you're thinking is, if I can just drag myself, he, he, he got a piece of rock and he would draw a line in front of him and he would drag himself across that line and then he'd take that rock and he'd draw another line and he just wanted to constantly get across. And then after his suffering, I'm thinking, uh, and I have problems? Like when, when the IRS wants to do an audit or the Federal Trade Commission says, hey, uh, you're growing too quickly, you gotta slow down. I, I, I consider that problems. <laughs> These are first world problems. I got no problems. No Al Qaeda's hunting me down while my hip's blown off, right? And so, you know, I fell in love with his mission, his story, and then of course saw the movie. Um, and so I decided, hey, we're going to donate to, to make sure his message is heard in Arizona so they can get the whole team of special forces guys there and to the venue. As it turns out, by giving that money and being a sponsor, they go, oh, you get two VIP tickets to meet the guy. I'm like, you're kidding me. Arizona's like the neighboring state. So jumped on a plane, went out there and met the man. And But I had no intentions of going or meeting him. I just wanted to help a guy whose book I read who's – Mentality helped me in my business. It was a great example of giving without expectations and then the universe giving you more than you ever thought possible. What a cool story. And man, Bedros, God bless you and your giving heart. So before I ask you the last 
signature question. I've got to ask, everyone's going to want to get a hold of you, you know, sign up for your services, all that good stuff. Where can people find you and what's something that's exciting coming up for you? Uh, yeah, so the easiest place to find me is on my blog, bedrosecoolian.com, where I a lot more of my rants and podcasts and, and YouTube videos. And um, really the only thing I have coming up is July of next year of 2018 is my book, Man Up. And it's really my process of manning up as an entrepreneur and finally cutting all the bullshit excuses and dominating my path as an entrepreneur. And Man Up is really about three specific things. You becoming an effective leader, you being clear on your vision and your path for your business, and you finally hiring and building up a high performance team and not just a group of employees. Employees clock in early, leave late. A team has a united goal, which is to win the game. And so, you know, I was able to man up and become the entrepreneur that I was meant to be. And in the last, you know, five, six years, I've made more money and a bigger impact than I had in the previous 15 years. And so that's what Man Up is all about. And people can just go to manup.com and uh, get on the early bird notification list if they want to learn more about it. Manup.com. Okay. I cannot wait for that book to come out. So last signature question, I get all sorts of different answers. It's really interesting to me. And that is why should people be unapologetic about their pursuit of wealth and success? Well, I'm going to steal a line from Mr. Grant Cardone on this one in, uh, in his book, 10X Rule. He says that you should be unapologetic about your desire to succeed and build wealth because you never know how much money you will need in the future. You know, we really don't know. And, you know, you know the reality is our parents are going to die. And if you're married, you got two sets of parents that you have to bury. And if you have siblings, maybe they're all not all going to be financially well off in life. And maybe someone, God forbid, gets cancer or a disease and you have to financially help them. Maybe, just maybe, and I hate for this to happen. God forbid another set of airplanes crash into the, 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 the towers in New York and the economy goes to shit. And so you have a duty and an obligation to make more money, create more wealth and create more opportunities for people around you than you think. And so where Grant Cardone is concerned, I think he hit that on the head spot on. Uh, ever since I read that in 10 X rule, uh, I've just been in, in make more money mode. And as it turns out, I make more impact. I'm able to pay my, my team more. And, and I, and I sleep better at night knowing that God forbid, if something happens to someone, I can financially be there to help them and not just go, man, I wish somebody would do something about this. I can make, put my money to work to help people that I love. Pedros, thank you so much. That's the best answer ever. And I just want you to know while I got this moment to tell you how much you inspire me, how much you make me step up my game and step up, step up my pace. And so just the hugest thank you for being on today. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity, man. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.